So with that opening, it, it's clear um, the, the topic for this year's conference is really, I think, focused on, on the changing geopolitical landscape. Now, of course, that interacts with all sorts of uh, macroeconomic policy challenges, uh, which will be the, the topic of the, the first panel, uh, which in turn really ha has two parts. Uh, I will n now move very quickly to, to the keynote uh, by, by the Executive Vice President of the Commission, Valdis Dombrovskis. Um, and be because of his, his time constraint, uh, after his, his keynote, uh, there may be some time for Q and A uh, with uh, with Valdis, and then after that, uh, I'll call up the, the panel members uh, for the second part of the session. But I think it's it's best to use the time to move immediately to, to the keynote. So over to you, Valdis. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Philip. Good morning, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking the European uh, Central Bank for the invitation uh, to speak at this conference on Central, Eastern and Southeastern uh, European uh, countries. Uh, I regret that I cannot be uh, with you in uh, person today. Uh, uh, we are now uh, well into uh, second year of Russia's brutal war against Ukraine. Uh, there appears to be little sign of the uh, Kremlin pausing its relentless and illegal campaign. Uh, when uh, this aggression started in February 2022, uh, EU member states were uh, just emerging from COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, back then, we were embarking on a solid recovery path. Uh, Russia's war changed at all. Uh, it has disrupted supply chains and led to an economic slowdown. Uh, it has threatened global food and energy security. Uh, it stoked inflation to record highs and, for many people, triggered a cost-of-living crisis. Uh, I know that CZ countries uh, were particularly hard hit by this. Uh, since they relied uh, heavily on Russian fossil fuels, the sharp rises in energy and food prices led to greater losses in people's purchasing power and higher consumer price inflation. Uh, subsequent rises in interest rates have made debt servicing and capital more expensive. Uh, all this has come at a time when there are massive investment needs to strengthen a green and digital economy and to protect our resilience and security. Uh, these needs are even more evident in CZ countries. Um, uh, Russia's war has forced the European Union, along with the democratic world, to deal with dramatically uh, altered uh, uh, international circumstances. Uh, economic challenges and fragmentation risks are increasing. Uh, this is also true of global trade flows. Uh, as CZ countries are generally open economies, often with strong ties with uh, Russia, this development is particularly relevant. Uh, this brings me to uh, some short-term challenges that they face. Uh, the first is to control inflation. Uh, since uh, spending on food and energy makes up a higher share of the consumer basket than in the rest of the EU, uh, CZ countries felt a greater initial price shock. Uh, infl inflation expectations may also adjust faster where there have been previous and not so distant periods of very high inflation. Uh, second, governments in these countries uh, may, uh, had to provide substantial fiscal support to uh, compensate for the impact of high energy prices and uh, on people's purchasing power. Uh, but this was often done in not very targeted way. Uh, it has amplified the impact on public debt and reduced incentives to lower energy demand and decouple from fossil fuels. Uh, with energy prices back to pre-war levels, this needs correction. Uh, fiscal policy needs to be uh, clearly restrictive, also to help bring down inflation. Uh, third, in uh, several of the region's countries, we see a risk of macroeconomic imbalances emerging. Uh, they result from a negative interplay between high inflation, also driven by domestic factors such as wage and profit dynamics, cost competitiveness losses and a deterioration of external sustainability. Uh, this requires a coherent mix of restrictive fiscal and monetary policies 
as well as structural policies to improve the functioning of labor, goods and services markets. Uh, despite these policy challenges, overall, uh, Europe has been able to adjust quickly. Uh, we have shown our resilience by acting together within the EU and with our neighborhood and global partners. Uh, regarding the EU economy, the outlook is better than we uh, uh, could have hoped uh, for a year ago. Uh, that said, the risks are still on the downside and the latest data provide mixed uh, picture. Uh, uh, for this year and next, we expect to see moderate growth and gradual decline in inflation. Uh, a strong labor market, a record low unemployment and a significant fall from the uh, energy price highs of last autumn should uh, provide continued support. Uh, we see a broadly uh, consistent picture uh, for CC countries as well. Uh, uh, in addition, for these uh, short term issues, there is an urgent need to tackle our significant structural challenges, uh, the green and digital transitions, uh, our dependence on uh, very few sources for a range of uh, critical and strategic inputs for our economy, uh, energy, for example, but also rare earths and minerals, and more broadly, strengthening our competitiveness. Uh, for the next few years, we can also rely on the Recovery and Resilience Facility, the RRF, to help EU member states become more sustainable, prepare them for new challenges, and shore up their uh, resilience to withstand future shocks. Uh, provided that member states properly carry out reforms and investments set out in their national resilience and recovery plans, the RRF should have a positive impact on all EU economies and societies well beyond its 2026 uh, cut-off date. Uh, what is uh, important now is uh, to press ahead with putting all the reforms and investments into effect to make sure that uh, RRF funds are fully absorbed. And EU member states are doing this. Uh, we uh, see a steady flow of RRF funding, uh, uh, even though with different speeds in terms of implementation. Uh, disbursements now stand at uh, more uh, than 153 billion euros. Uh, in terms of additional economic growth and net of uh, spillover effects, uh, uh, RRF's uh, estimated impact is 43% higher in CZ countries than for other EU countries. Uh, this also creates a significant uh, positive spillover effect for non-CZ member states, uh, which in turn strengthens the EU single market. The uh, RRF contributes uh, around 104 billion euros uh, to make the CZ countries more resilient, more sustainable and better prepared for challenges and opportunities of green and digital transitions. Uh, so far, 14 billion euros have been disbursed. Uh, in May 2022, the RRF was uh, given a key role to play in the Repower EU plan. The EU's response to the uh, socio-economic hardships and global energy market disruptions caused by Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, Repower EU is particularly important for CZ countries. Uh, uh, several have uh, carbon-intensive energy systems and a historic high dependence on Russian energy supplies. Uh, the high ambitions of CZ countries are already reflected in the climate and environmental contributions in their plans. Uh, on average, these are 10% higher than for other member states. The uh, ongoing process to revise national plans and include uh, Repower EU chapters is an opportunity to deepen this dimension. Uh, in short, the RRF is a highly agile instrument. Uh, it is a unique chance to invest in the future, to strengthen competitiveness, social economic convergence and growth. Uh, moving to climate neutrality and embracing the digital age go hand in hand with strengthening Europe's competitiveness. Uh, to stay competitive, we are pursuing the concept of open strategic autonomy, uh, combining uh, international leadership and engagement with measures to strengthen the single market. Uh, how, however, as we benefit from an open economy, we must also preserve our economic security. Uh, this means building on our strengths, maintaining and growing partnerships around the world, while addressing identified risks in a targeted and proportionate way. 
Uh, our strategy on economic security is based on three pillars. Promoting, protecting and partnering. Uh, promoting the EU's competitiveness, uh, protecting our economic security using a range of existing tools, also considering new ones, and uh, partnering with the broadest possible range of reliable partners to strengthen economic security. Uh, uh, in the world that has become more contested and geopolitical, we must work together to ensure Europe's sovereignty, security and prosperity in years to come. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me conclude with some observations about the geopolitical and economic importance of the CZ region. Uh, for the EU, uh, it has been strategically important for several uh, de uh, decades. Uh, this importance has also only increased with the recent tectonic changes and the EU's geopolitical and geoeconomic situation. Uh, it has become more urgent than ever to stand up for European values and interests and to support our partners in building more politically and economically stable societies. The EU has a strategic interest in having a peaceful and prosperous neighbours. We can only be secure and thrive if our neighbours do, do, do so. Uh, uh, Russia's war of aggression has uh, had an effect of bringing the EU and its neighbouring countries closer together. This is also thanks uh, to prompt support provided by the EU, uh, for example, fully integrating Western Balkans in the EU food security initiatives, uh, providing 1 billion euros support to address their energy needs, and raising budget for uh, Eastern Partnership and also macrofinancial assistance. Uh, uh, one, uh, 100, uh, 145 million euros in macrofinancial assistance for Moldova this year and uh, 18 billion euros in MFA Plus for Ukraine. Uh, for the EU's longer-term support for Ukraine, as you know, the Commission has proposed uh, the new Ukraine facility, uh, which is worth uh, up to 50 billion euros in grants and loans. Uh, it aims to provide stable, predictable support up to 2027 for Ukraine's macrofinancial stability, long-term reconstruction and reforms needed for its path towards EU accession. Uh, I would also like to mention the vital role that uh, central banks play to ensure price stability and overall healthy and stable economies in our partner countries. Uh, a good example is a regional project that the European system of central banks is implementing with EU support to strengthen central bank capacities in the Western Balkans. Uh, it brings together 20 EU member states central banks, the ECB, and six central banks from Western Balkans. Uh, I see many new opportunities for both sides. Uh, the potential is clear. In uh, 2022, the Eastern Partnership region was the EU's 11th trading partner. The EU is a first trading partner for countries such as Ukraine, uh, Georgia and Moldova. Uh, in the Western Balkans, the EU is a main investor, donor and trade partner. Uh, let us remember too that the CZ region is converging. Uh, eventually, it will form a much larger part of the EU. Uh, raising income levels for those uh, EU member states located in this uh, 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 region up to the average of the, re to, uh, of the rest of the EU could add more than 10% to our collective GDP. Uh, one way to strengthen the EU's economic potential is to speed up this convergence process and make it more sustainable. Uh, we can do this by promoting a policy dialogue on structural reforms, deepening our trade links, and boosting investments via economic and investment plans in Western Balkans and Eastern Partnership countries. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope I have given you a flavor of how the uh, Central, Eastern and Southeastern European countries uh, fit into challenging contexts that Europe uh, faces today along with the high value and importance that we attach to our friends and neighbours in this region. Thank you.